So hello, hello everyone. Uh, if you'd like to take a seat, I think we should get started. Uh, my name is Robin Lloyd. I'm part of the welcoming committee here for Michael Rupert. And we are delighted that he's starting his tour here in Burlington, going on to uh, a number of other towns in Vermont. And I think Vermont is ready for him, ready for his message. And so I'm really excited about the fact that you're all here today and we're going to hear, uh, hear him speak. He's uh, been preceded here with his book, which is um, outside and which you can buy, and also the film Conf Confronting Collapse, which uh, some, some folks have seen, and I think it's a really powerful incentive and invitation to come and hear him, especially as uh, events have, have changed since the film was made, the crisis in the Gulf, which I hope we will be asking him about and getting his opinion on. Uh, I'd like to thank all the, the sponsors of tonight, but especially Chelsea Green Press and Ian Baldwin, who is here. They've published his book at a time when uh, I think he was having a difficult time finding a publisher. And, uh, and they are really the uh, key sponsor of the tour. The other sponsors for here in, in Burlington is the Peace and Justice Center, the transition town of Charlotte and Shelburne, who have the, um, the, 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 those are two towns with the most active committee of helping communities adjust to the consequences of peak oil and, and collapse. Uh, the U UVM Environmental Program and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom of Burlington. So to, uh, to introdu introduce Michael Rupert is uh, Cheryl Dirsch, who is my co-conspirator on the welcoming committee. Hi. Um, Michael Rupert is um, internationally recognized as a speaker on peak oil. Um, in light of the um, unfolding in the Gulf, I'm excited to hear what he has to teach us about peak oil and um, what we must confront. Um, so um, Michael Rupert is a former LAPD narcotics investigator. Um, he's a whistleblower, and he is also a 1973 um, honors grad from UCLA in political science. Um, for years, Michael Rupert was a one-man crusader. Um, he um, 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 trying to expose America's bogus war on drugs. He's the founder and editor of From the Wilderness, which is a newsletter website um, dedicated to um, political cover-ups. He authored Crossing the Rubicon, The Decline of the American Empire at the End of the Age of Oil, which was also added in um, Harvard's library, Harvard University's library. His um, recent book is Confronting Collapse, like Robin suggested. You can get a signed copy out in the lobby after the talk. Um, the peaking of world oil production will surely prove to be one of the most fundamental challenges of our time. Uh, Vermont is perfect uh, for asking the tough questions about peak oil, economic collapse, and global warfare, with Vermont's history rooted in resistance. Vermont played an important role in the American Revolution, resisting the advances of the neighboring colonies. In 1777, Vermont um, declared um, independent republic and um, remained for 14 years. Our purpose for bringing Michael Rupert tonight is to educate you um, on peak oil, but perhaps um, our secondary um, 
more important goal is to empower you um, with the knowledge, the connections, and the inspiration to make the profound changes in your lives. Michael's wisdom reminds us that the solution to this dilemma is found in our individual minds. Our minds need to be open to every thoughtful choice that we make. We hope tonight provides you with the inspiration you need to take action. Um, Michael, in your film, uh, you spoke frequently about your frustrations and your um, wanting to quit. So I just want to say thank you for your stick to and coming here tonight um, so that we can benefit and learn um, the local solutions for the energy dilemma. So with further ado, Michael, it's your turn. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, it's great to be back in Burlington. I was here first in uh, 1998. I was passing through on a tour. Uh, I was on a speaking panel with, among others, a former Black Panther named Aruba bin Wahad, who had served 22 years in prison for a murder he did not commit after the FBI had admitted framing him. He was given a several million dollar settlement and shipped off to Ghana. And that was uh, two years after, less than two years after, I had confronted CIA Director John Deutsch at Lock, Lock High School about the CIA smuggling drugs into the country. <clears throat> and I knew that I liked Vermont. It was April of 1998. We arrived here in Burlington, and we were walking around, not, not far from here, actually. And it had been kind of overcast, and all of a sudden, the sun came out. And what I saw was people running out of buildings like they were on fire, throwing clothes everywhere. Uh, and I thought, I, I'd like to come back here. <laughs> <laughs> so here I am all these years later with a better understanding of Vermont, but also a very deep appreciation and respect for your deep strain of independent thought and independent courage. I just had dinner. Uh, that I wasn't expecting, where two of two heroes of mine were sitting, were sitting on my right, and one across from me. Uh, the two heroes were Dennis Morisot and uh, and Jerry Colby, who wrote a great book called "I Will Be Done: Nelson Rockefeller and the Conquest of the Amazon." And here they are, both in Burlington, Vermont. So I feel in very good company, uh, and I'm here thanks to Ian Baldwin and and Margot Baldwin of Chelsea Green Publishing, the publishers of my new book, Confronting Collapse, uh, which will be available outside. And uh, that's the basis of the movie Collapse. How many people here have seen the documentary Collapse? Good. Uh, as you know, for those of you who haven't, the movie was released September 12th in Toronto at the Toronto International Film Festival to rave reviews that still boggle my mind. From the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Variety, Roger A. Bear gave it four stars and twittered above all else, see collapse above all else. Uh, we were Time Magazine, pick, all of which stunned me no end. We are a leading contender for best documentary in next year's Oscars. Uh, that's the Hollywood buzz. Uh, since then, I've been privileged to meet some very nice people and some of them with large names. I've been told that uh, Sir Richard Branson has seen the movie which prompted him to go to Britain's Energy Secretary, Lord Hunt, who recently convened an emergency summit on peak oil. And also there was uh, another guy at a screening in New York named Mel Gibson who walked up to, to the director, Chris Smith, and said, I want to see what's on the floor. The cut, it's the cuts that didn't make the movie. And uh, uh, Mel actually called my house one day, and I had an assistant at the time when I had some money. Phone rang. And she said, uh, hello, may I tell him who's calling? Mel Gibson. You know, and, and I said, well, uh, to ask him to hold on, I'll pick it up on the extension. And I grabbed the extension, went out to the living room, and I said, well, we didn't get dressed up for nothing. You'd have to see Braveheart to get that. Uh, he gets it. Uh, there are a lot of people who get it. I'm not at liberty to drop the names, but those names are stepping forward. 
Uh, but it's that that's the good news and the bad news is like uh, by the time we saw the light it was too late uh, and that may be unfortunately where we are right now more than half of the predictions I made in that movie have come true since the movie was released and they will all come true I we have I have what we call a map that I've made as a result of my work and, and the help of a great many other people especially the people who taught me about peak oil that would be Colin Campbell Ken DeFaze, Richard Heinberg, uh, a great list of people in, who pioneered the peak oil movement and who have all been vindicated now by facts and reality. Where I'm different from those in the peak oil movement, which basically says that once you reach the point of uh, peak oil production, no matter what you do, you cannot increase oil production and economic growth is not possible without oil. There are no substitutes, there are no replacements, there is nothing that will support the edifice built by fossil fuels, and fossil fuels are in decline. And in every lecture I have given, and it's in this book also, is a single chart. It's also in my first book, Crossing the Rubicon, which shows human population roughly from the time of Christ stable at about one, one and a half billion people. There's a little dip for the bubonic plague. And then at the beginning of the industrial era, when, when uh, they were burning wood, there's a slight uptick. And then comes coal and a slight uptick like this. And then around 1890 or so, oil began to be used and human population shot up to 7 billion people. Those 5 plus billion people who are here today exist only because of oil. It's that simple. There are 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy in every calorie of food consumed in the industrialized world today. If you take away the oil and the natural gas, you take away the food. If you take away the food, the population goes. It is that simple. There is nothing that can replace oil. Now, we have two very clear and distinct studies. One was conducted by Robert Hirsch, who I've met. I've met everybody in the peak oil movement, and I pay homage to everybody in that peak oil movement and the sustainability movement. But there are two studies. One was, uh, one was a book written by Professor David Goodstein, uh, Vice Chancellor of Caltech, who said very clearly what many of us know, that it takes 30 years to change an energy infrastructure, assuming that you had something to change to. And the second study was written by Robert Hirsch of SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation, a major government CIA intelligence contractor that came out in, I think, 2005 that's, that looked at the peak oil scenarios and all the projections and said, and I will summarize, that if you started changing 30 years before peak, you would have serious damage. If you started changing 20 years before, you would have catastrophic damage if you started changing 10 years worse than catastrophic and if you waited until it happened you're screwed. Peak oil arrived in the end of 2005 period. The facts are very clear now it has since the movie has been released and the movie collapse has had a dramatic impact all over the world we know that because it's been pirated more than almost two million times which really makes me angry because I've had no income from the movie due to the piracy. Uh, and I've had no income for more than a year now as a result. The, the, D the DVD goes on sale June 15th. We're hoping to catch some ground then, but the movie's had a great run uh, in about 17 or 18 cities. It had a cable run. It's now available on iTunes, and, and the DVD is coming out. But we know that the movie is having a dramatic global impact because the message in the movie is very, very clear. Human industrial civilization is collapsing. Period. It cannot be reversed. It is not possible to sustain the way of life that we have known. No green, lefty, liberal, feel-good, politically correct kumbaya fantasies are going to prevent it. No wishful thinking will prevent it. It is not a political issue. It is a scientific Darwinian issue that applies to everything from bacteria in a petri dish with unlimited food supply to caribou on an Arctic island that when a, when a species encounters a favorable set, of circum, favorable set of circumstances, it will breed and multiply and grow and expand. And the history of every bubble is that they all crash and die. And that is exactly where we are today. Over the course of 
30 years of, of, of my career, 20 of those being an, uh, an active investigative journalist, author of two books, lecturing, I don't know, 20, 30 f universities in eight countries. Uh, uh, it has been estimated, and I never kept count, but I get messages saying, you know, you're right about 80% of the time. Ted Williams only had to bat 400 to be the best in baseball. Now, I'm right 80% of the time, not because I have a crystal ball, not because I am spiritually plugged in like Karnak the Magnificent from the old Johnny Carson days. It's because I have what I call a map uh, accumulated over many years. And I have to, again, tip my hat to Jerry Colby because his, his book, Thy Will Be Done, is, 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 is the model that I use to write my book, Crossing the Rubicon. And that map says very clearly that we are not only at that point, but it is irreversible. So with the collapse of human industrial civilization, a given, a fait accompli happening in front of our eyes as we speak, what do we do now? The debate becomes simple when you understand it in those terms. In the movie, I made a number of predictions. More than half of those predictions have come true. I talked extensively about Greece in a segment filmed in March of 2009. Has, is there anybody who has not heard about Greece now? I said that the FDIC would go insolvent. Just a couple of months ago, the FDIC was insolvent to the tune of $24 billion. There are now 700-plus troubled banks on the FDIC's troubled bank list. That's more than there were in 2008. I'm going to go on for a little bit, and hopefully this will sink in. A great deal has been said by Ron Paul, who I know. Ron Paul was in my first video, Truth and Lies of 9-11. I know Ron Paul. I have great respect for him. Since his district is in Houston, he can't possibly acknowledge peak oil. He would lose his safe seat. But Ron Paul has the right idea on money and economics, and he and I are, are on exactly the same page with that. And for people who have accepted the fact that maybe the government can just keep printing money, I would, I would submit to you that if that were the case, then any of 10, 15 previous empires or civilizations that have collapsed would still be here if they could just continue printing money. It can't happen. About two months ago, maybe three months ago, the International Monetary Fund uh, released a study. I'm going to try to move this if I can because I like to pace when I talk. Hold on. Oh, well. All right. I I'm anchored. Pull it out. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> now I feel like I'm at a congressional hearing. Um, here, I'll put that one there. About two, three months ago, the International Monetary Fund released a report that said another round of bailouts would trigger massive civil unrest around the globe. Has anybody looked at Greece? and seeing what the bailouts are doing there, because what comes with every bailout now is a mandate that every government must cut back on spending. For most Americans, we hear of cutbacks in spending, and we think that that's something that has never touched us. Well, it will touch you this year. On an estimated, I, I forget what it is, it's, it's, it's many millions of unemployed. We have about 45 million unemployed in the country uh, right now. When their unemployment benefits run out and there are no replacements. You will see it this year when states like California and many other states, Ohio, Michigan, stop paying state pensions. You will see it this year or next when the United States government, as a result of another round of bailouts, you know, Fannie, and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are just getting ready to ask for another $150 billion. billion. You can't print money forever, because as you print money forever, you see what, how many people have heard of credit default swaps? Okay, basically, as I was writing it from the wilderness, and I was writing this in 2001, 2002, but in Paris in 2003 at a peak oil conference, I heard a Dutch economist, Martin Van Morick, stand up and say, I have done a detailed study, and I have concluded that it may not be profitable to slow decline. 
You got that. It is more profitable to kill people. It is more profitable to shut down services. It is more profitable through things like credit default swaps where you bet that businesses, countries, states, and cities will fail. You can make more money that way by betting on the failure than you can by trying to save them. That's the way the infinite growth ec economic paradigm works. You make money on the way up, you make money on the way down. And now credit default swaps, I don't know if any of you have ever seen my blog, Mike, MikeRupert.blogspot.com, anybody ever look at that? All right, there every day you will find, thanks to people like Jenna Orkin and a wonderful researcher named Bryce Farmer, who birth, bo both learned how to do research from me, a compendium, a digest of news stories from around the world that is the best summation of the true state of what's happening around the world. And on the blog, you will see that credit default swaps against state and local governments are soaring at the moment. In other words, Goldman Sachs is betting that Los Angeles will go bankrupt. Goldman Sachs is betting that Michigan will go bankrupt. And therefore, they exert their financial pressure to make that happen so that they will make more money. The United States government is a servant of the Federal Reserve System, specifically the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Barack Obama is a servant of the New York Fed. And he's protecting the New York Fed. Now, what that means is that the New York Fed and the infinite growth economic paradigm are waging wars on states and cities now. So in that context, and this is not too difficult to understand, empires don't break up, they break down. Every empire that's ever existed, what did it do? It broke down into regions, it broke down into cities, it broke down into governa governable regions. Now with peak oil, we have first and foremost the problem of local food production. With peak oil and with economic collapse, we will no longer have strawberries from Chile, or grapes from Chile, or anchovies that are caught in off the British coast and shipped to Australia for packaging in tin cans and then flown here to be sold. 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy in every calorie of food consumed in the industrialized world. Now I have been traveling the world and since the movie has been released I've been to maybe 15 to 20 venues around the United States where usually I stand up and say, how many people can even have a clue about how much of the food they eat is grown within 100 miles of where they live? Anybody have any idea around here? I see some hands. Great. How many people here make an active effort to purchase food that is grown locally? God bless you. I've, the only place in the country where I've seen a higher percentage of hands raised in the audience is Portland, Oregon. <laughs> and I have been to Portland maybe 12 times in the last decade, and I'm very well known in Portland. And it's not just me, it's the whole movement, but the Pacific Northwest gets it. So with these kinds of pressures occurring, now we're at the point now, y y we all saw this trillion dollar nuclear bailout of Greece you know, where uh, uh, President Sarkozy of, of France, you know, stood up and said, ah, we have donated a trillion dollars, we will save Greece. The markets had a rally one day and a sell-off the next. They shot their whole wad with a trillion dollars of printed money in one day. Nobody believes it. Greece is still screwed. The dominoes are falling. Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, the pigs are all going. Britain has a higher debt to GDP ratio than Greece does. And Britain is teetering on the abyss. The global economy now is fungible. It, people, I heard people is, is speaking in shock, oh my god, the Federal Reserve's lending money to Greece, which just came out a few days ago. Well, if you'd been reading my blog, you would have seen that we were saying that the Federal, the Federal Reserve was was sending off the books money to Greece about five months ago. 
Because everybody understands that, as I said in the movie, the infinite growth paradigm is chasing a $700 trillion derivatives bubble down the toilet. And anybody who hangs on to the economic paradigm of infinite growth, fractional reserve banking, fiat currency, is going to take the ride. Now, I, I, I've been asked here to speak uh, by some people who are involved in a secessionist movement in Vermont, and I heartily approve. But then I look at it kind of philosophically. Secession is going to be a fact whether people seek it or not as the United States government collapses. There's a great writer named Dmitry Orlov, who I was, my, my newsletter from the wilderness was the first to publish in his career back in 2003, I think it was, or 2002. We published, and he's a brilliant guy. I love him. He's got a great sense of humor. You should hear him tell jokes with Russian accent. He's very funny. Um, there are five stages of collapse. Financial, commercial, political, social, and cultural. We've had, we've, the financial has arrived, the commercial is in progress. That's where goods and services begin to stop flowing, where you can't get things and, and businesses fail en masse and services get cut back. The political phase is where the people lose absolute or lose faith in their government. Has anybody been paying attention to things like the sudden emergence of militia groups or a guy flying an airplane into the IRS building in Austin, Texas, or all of the signs of discontent that are around this country? And if Barack Obama, who has made all of these promises on behalf of the New York Fed, trying to keep people spending money they don't have, borrowing money, sacrificing them as lambs, for the sake of the infinite growth paradigm, if we hear of another round of bailouts, and if the Dow, which is going to happen very soon, uh, I and, and, and my friend James Howard Kunstler are both predicting a Dow in the 4,000s by the end of this year. Remember, I'm right 80% of the time, so scoff at your own damn risk. I've been right for two decades. I may get your attention, maybe not. Darwinian deselection is none of my business. It's the only way I stay sane. It's the only way those of us who actually see what's happening stay sane. So in this mix now, all of a sudden, man in his having plucked all the low-hanging fruit of energy in terms of oil and natural gas is betting on two things to sustain an infinite growth paradigm something called shale gas, which is poisonous, destructive of the environment, uses more, f more fresh water than you can possibly imagine, destroys farmland, and is, 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 according to Matthew Simmons, also a friend of mine, Matthew is, Matt's the world's largest energy investment banker, is a net energy loser. For those of you who don't know, net energy asks the question, how much energy do you put in to get energy back? Methanol is a net energy loser. It's also destroying food. Corn is a food. I'm sorry. So we're betting our futures on shale gas, which will never deliver what you see in the commercials on CNN and CNBC, and deep water offshore drilling. Now let me talk for a minute about global decline rates. In the movie, in the documentary Collapse, I went around and around with director Chris Smith, and by the way, Chris Smith did a great job on the movie. I could not be happier than what I saw in that movie. If that movie was the book of my life, he got it right. And you know how gratifying it is to read a really good book and you go to the movie and it satisfies you like the book did? He got it right. But he vetted every aspect of my life. He made me prove every detail of my life because he wasn't going to take any risk. And I was saying in the movie, the decline rate's 9%. 9%. He said, no, man, they say it's not 9%. I said, look, the EIA report leaked it, 9%. And of course, since that time, right after the movie was released, two, new, two senior executives, uh, two senior officials from the International Energy Agency of the UN, uh, went to Britain's The Guardian with documents of the IEA saying, yeah, it's not only 9%, it's probably greater, and, and the figures on world oil reserves were cooked as a result of pressure from the U.S. government. Because the U.S. government requires people to keep borrowing money and spending on consumer goods to buoy up the stock market 
to sucker people into debt, etc. We all know the story. But since that time, a number of more startling admissions have come out. Peak oil is confirmed. It's been confirmed by reports from Saudi Arabia. President Obama's uh, oil advisor, I forget his name, but he was recently in Paris, and my friend Richard Heinberg and the people at Post Carbon Institute, also wonderful people, caught it, issued a press release. He confirmed peak oil in Paris. Uh, Richard Branson, who had seen the movie, un undoubtedly went to Lord Hunt, emergency. So peak oil is now going mainstream. I was turning on N MSNBC, the, excuse me, CNBC the other day, those lying bastards, and, and yet here's this pundit talking about peak oil like he just read my book and seen the movie. He was using every phrase that I used in the movie, and he's a financial expert. And I thought, my God, I haven't had a joint yet. I haven't had a drink yet. Am I, am I watching this? Yeah, okay. Uh, but what that tells me, being the hardened, cynical, investigative journalist, ex-cop, seeing every kind of lie that can be told, is that if they're saying this now at this level, it must be twice as bad as they're admitting. But they can't hide it anymore. But to put it in perspective, it, just assuming the global decline rate was only 9%. Fadi Birol, F-A-T-I-H-B-I-R-O-L, who is the head of the International Energy Agency of the UN, said about, I don't know, six, eight months ago, that to offset a 9% global decline rate, we would need to find three new Saudi Arabias. For those of you who don't know, Saudi Arabia has 25% of the known oil on the planet, and they have passed their peak. That's also been confirmed, although not trumpeted. So in desperation now, mankind and its hunger for energy and its hunger to feed itself on the infinite growth paradigm is stretching its technology to the furthest limits of its ability to go off the coast of Mexico, to go 5,000 feet underwater, to drill 16, 18, 20 some thousand feet down, to grab a maybe 50 million barrel reservoir of oil, a drop in the bucket, the world's using 83, 84 million barrels a day now. And what did we get as a result of stretching our technology to the limit because we didn't have the safety mechanisms to get us off that far branch of the tree that we were going for that apple and we fell off and there is no net. Matthew Simmons said clearly recently in print, and I agree with him completely, first of all it's, con it's confirmed from a number of places uh, that, and, and this really scares me because the mainstream media is caught in the lie of insisting that leak is 5,000 barrels per day. It's at minimum 25,000 barrels per day. It might be as high as 100,000 barrels a day. Admiral Thad Allen, Commandant of the Coast Guard, was asked that question point blank in a press conference and he said, it may be. Nobody's denied it. 25,000 barrels a day. Matt Simmons said, the only alternative we may have is to let a 50 million barrel reservoir empty itself into the Gulf of Mexico. That is a cataclysmic event for the planet. All of the Gulf of Mexico coast is ruined in perpetuity. Now, you take Florida, Alabama, Mississippi with some of the highest foreclosure rates in the country already covered with now with these hotels and these homes that the rich people own that are now going to be worthless and the foreclosure rate will triple, quadruple in those states and the troubled banks in those states will go over the edge. You've just wiped out the seafood fishing industry, two or three billion dollars a year, all the jobs and now you have maybe 10, 15 million displaced people who must leave there to go find some place else to live plus an environmental disaster that only God can comprehend at this point. From a simple perspective, there are two, the word loop in the case of the Gulf oil spill has two meanings. First, there's the loop current, which feeds around the southern tip of Florida, up the east of Florida, into the Gulf Stream, which, fleet, which feeds the warm water up through around Iceland and Greenland to Britain, which is what keeps Europe inhabitable. 50 million barrels of oil get there, God knows the catastrophic change, but it will destroy the entire fishing industry off of Cape Cod, Cape Hatteras, the eastern seaboard. 
But there's another loop that's even more important, the Louisiana offshore oil port. Anybody know what that is? The super tankers that bring our oil from Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi, wherever they're bringing the oil from, are too big to bring into the port of New Orleans. So they have to go to a Louisiana offshore oil port about 10 miles, whatever, 15 miles off the coast of Louisiana and tie up. And guess what? The oil spill is heading toward the loop. Now, a tanker full of billions, hundreds of tens of millions of gallons of flammable liquid cannot offload when it's floating in flammable liquid. What happens to U.S. oil imports then? Let me put it to you another way. Before the crash of 2008, oil hit $147 a barrel. Does anybody remember that? Does anybody doubt that there was a connection between $147 oil and what happened in 2008? No. But now we've blown our bailout wad. The Federal Reserve has printed all the money it can. It can't print anymore, and here's, let me explain just for a moment, parenthetically, how that works. Some people assume that the government could just keep on printing money and just keep going. No, it, it can't happen, and we're seeing that in Europe now, because uh, Trichet, who is the head of the European Central Bank, you know, they, they got together with the IMF and they got this trillion dollar bailout, but now the spread, if you will, on bonds, in other words, Greek bonds, for years, uh, there was a guy named Ross Perot, you know, short, hi, I'm Ross Perot, short, floppy hair, Texan with a big nose, I'm running for president, and I want you to listen to me, I want to tell you the truth, now pay very close attention. I was his press secretary in Los Angeles in 1992 before he sold us out. And Ross said, I got my money in the safest place in the world, U.S.T. bonds. It only pays half percent interest, but it's the safest place in the world. That, when you get low yields on government bonds, that means your money is safe. The riskier the loan, the higher the interest rate. Greeks are now offering 9, 10, 11, 12 percent. Nobody wants the bond. Spanish rates are going up. What that does when it hits the banking sector, because the banking sector has to service the bonds, is they have to raise interest rate, which triggers inflation. At a point in time when China is getting ready to drop, drop the dollar, when the Federal Reserve has doubled its capitalization, we've got an extra trillion dollars printed by the Federal Reserve it, 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 since 2008. All this money that's been printed is about to come home and come home valueless. Hence, as I have predicted for more than a decade, or as for, for, for a decade, we now see gold heading. It just broke its all-time high, and I'm telling you, you will see $2,000 gold before the year's out. I'm only right 80% of the time. Physical gold, not paper gold. Gold that you own, that you possess, that's buried in your backyard or in a safe or in your safety deposit box. Do never buy paper. There's five, ten times more paper gold out there than there is physical gold. Anybody who believes anything that Wall Street or the U.S. government tells you about money, you deserve to be Darwinianly deselected at this point. <laughs> We've been lied to about everything from you know, AIG, Citigroup, bonds, and it, to steroids in baseball. And do you expect that they're going to tell you the truth now? So in that context, inflation is on the way. Oil will probably spike to $100 a barrel within the next couple of months because the, uh, the as uh, uh, I think his name was Jeff Rubin, a brilliant editorial writer for the Globe and Mail, said that Deepwater Horizon is the three-mile island of deep water drilling. No nuclear reactors were built in this country after, after three-mile island. There will be no more deep water ventures. And of course, at $150, $200 million a pop, that's probably a very good argument anyway. But whatever oil's out there, we're not going for anymore, especially with the ecological disaster. So $100 oil hits now, it's going to have the same effect that 147 oil did. And, of course, if there's an attack on Iran, <laughs> which is likely now, not likely as possible, you know, uh, what, what will happen if there is an attack on Iran is that China will back Iran. China has about two, three hundred billion invested in Iran. The French can't live without Iranian oil. China can't live without Iranian oil. Japan, we'll come to Japan in a minute, can't live without Iranian oil. 
Venezuela will back Iran. Venezuela, our third or fourth largest oil supplier to the U.S., will declare an embargo in support of Iran. You'll see $200 oil overnight. The economy will shut down like a light switch. Are you ready for that? What all of us in the peak oil system... Let, uh, let me go back to Japan for a second. People don't talk about Japan. Japan has a debt-to-GDP ratio greater than just about anybody out there. GDP, gross domestic product. J Japan's debt-to-GDP ratio, I forget what it is. I, I, I knew the number, but it's monstrously high. J Japan is imploding, but Japan has no international monetary fund or European central bank to fall back on. They're the third largest economy in the world. And it's a universal agreement that the only thing driving the whole global economy right now is China. China is superheated. Their bubble is so hot that real estate prices are rising 20% a month. Does that sound like speculative fever? The Chinese are having to stop real estate speculation in China. China's having mass massive social unrest, and we spent a lot of time on my blog and elsewhere, and I in my writings, showing that the Chinese bubble is about to implode. There are only two great bubbles on this planet left to go. The Chinese bubble and the human population bubble. And after the Chinese bubble goes, the human population bubble goes. Now we throw Deepwater Horizon into that mix, and we've got a pretty dicey situation. And I speak now, I will be so bold as to speak to, for everyone in the peak oil sustainability movement, the heroes who were there. I've been at it 10 years. People who were going back to Marion King Hubbard in the late 40s. But let's talk about the leaders and the giants now. Colin Campbell, Richard Heinberg, Matthew Simmons, Ken DeFaze of Princeton, Professor Al Bartlett. Congressman Roscoe Bartlett, uh, there are so many of us who have been beating our brains out, trying to make people listen to say, guys, there are times when somebody says it's here and they're right. Now, what we have is a very short amount of time. Like I said in the movie, that cut that I think it will be an outtake on, on the DVD June 15th. Chris Smith, Chris Smith asked me, when will the cliff event come? And I said, no later than the summer of 2010. How do I analogize the cliff event to anything that's remotely accessible to our experience? I likened it to the sinking of the Titanic. And what happened on the sinking of the Titanic? There were not enough lifeboats. And what I said in the movie clearly was, if you're on the Titanic and you know the ship is going to sink, and you find one group of people who says that the ship is unsinkable, unsinkable, you're doomers, you're gloomers, you're not politically correct, I'm going to the bar, I don't want to say anything that will upset anybody, leave me alone. Well. The big mistake that many people who got what was, what was happening did was to try to persuade those people. I say, let them die. Then there's a group of people who are deer caught in the headlights. And you can't reason, you can't penetrate. But then there's some who say, can you show me how to make a lifeboat? I only know we have a little time. That's the position the human race is in right now. And as I come to Vermont with a secessionist movement and with your own streak of independence and with this beautiful, beautiful state that you have, with the resources that you have and the culture that you have and the history that you have, I, I look around and the first thing I see is this is like an already defined lifeboat. You can get sustainable here. You might not have strawberries from Chile, but like the people who inhabited this place and who settled it, you can live, you can raise families, you can stay warm, you can survive, you can make clothes, and you can be healthy. The question is, do you understand the need to make a lifeboat? Now, the reason why, why I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be coming here uh, as a result of Ian's request to help with the secessionist movement to talk to them and say, look, you're going to secede one way or the other. When the United States government collapses, 
you're going to find yourselves on your own. But if you wait to do that, then you will wait until the Federal Reserve and the New York Reserve Bank and Goldman Sachs destroy your state bonds, your, you, your municipal bonds, before they tax you to send relief to a Gulf Coast that is already doomed. And I'm sorry, this is not a case for being politically nice, but I live in Venice, California on the beach, you know, in Culver City, Venice, right on the beach. I don't want to send my money to bail out the lost cause of the southeastern Gulf Coast of the United States. The Pacific Northwest doesn't. And as a matter of survival, would you take money from your children's mouths to help people far away who you already knew were doomed? No. And a lot of us have seen this fragmentation. When the Roman Empire broke up, what did it do? It broke down. It fragmented. You take any empire, the Mayan Empire, the Spanish Empire, all of them, they all break apart. And you must look first to where you live. That has been the constant theme of the sustainability movement from day one is relocalization. Now, I am currently involved as a matter of necessity, and let me just update you on my personal status a little bit. Uh, at the end of the movie, Collapse, it said I couldn't pay my rent, and that was released in September. Now, since then, uh, I have taken some speaking engagements, but I have still had no money from that. And yet I've had about $15,000 in donations which have all gone into the establishment of a new company called Collapse Net or Collapse Network. Uh, which we're close to launching. I have every penny in that right now. And there are four of us uh, who are part of the board, and we have like seven volunteers or eight volunteers now, which will involve three different things. First of all, it will bring you regular video updates from me. And I guess if Richard Branson is reading them, you might want to read them too. If Wall Street is reading them, you might want to read them too. But that will be done by video, plus my blog, which will be uh, an expanding daily digest of key stories from around the world so that we can see how what's happening in Greece is going to tell us what we can expect here, whether it's Greece, Romania, Britain, wherever it's happening, Thailand. You know, lights are going out all over the world. Now we've been tracking that. Cities all over the world are cutting out. You know, the state of Minnesota has just introduced a bill to cut its state police in half. California has released, I don't know, 15 to 25,000 felons from prison quietly because they can't afford to feed them at the same time that California law enforcement budgets are shrinking. That's a recipe for civil unrest. And as federal cutbacks happen, you're going to see the same thing. CollapseNet will be your early warning system for what to expect. But aside from the updates and the blog and the news stories, we are gonna, we, we're developing our own software so that when you become a member of CollapseNet, let's say your name is Fred Smith. You, you may want to be known as Fred Smith or you may want a handle that says, you know, Rutabaga22, whatever, and, and, and you live in Burlington in a zip code. When you enter on the map and you have a skill set, whether it be first aid, beekeeping, seamstress, soil restoration, organic farming, gunsmithing, uh, whatever, you will be plotted in your zip code and every other member of CollapseNet who already is wanting to build a lifeboat will be plotted right next to you and you'll say, oh God, there's a nurse over here and None of your personal information will be given out unless you want to, but it will be a way to find those people close to you who get it, who are building lifeboats right where you live. And we will facilitate you communicating with each other. Plus, we're going to build a directory of services. Who's doing what? Because I'll tell you one thing else. <clears throat> and this is what makes me really mad. <clears throat> is that... I first started saying CIA was dealing drugs in 1979. And of course, you know what I got. You're an idiot. You're a conspiracy theorist. Oh, you're tin hat. Now if I say CIA stealing drugs, everybody says, well, sure. And since the movie has come out, <clears throat> there was one benefit of the movie being pirated two million times or so around the world. We have a very active Facebook page for the movie Collapse. And I started getting all these messages on Facebook. Hi, I'm Vlad from Romania. I just saw your movie on download. I think you're a great hero. You are wonderful. I just stole your movie, but I love you. And I thank you very much. <laughs> you know, so I'm getting all these messages because, you know, that was my 30 cents a copy that I never got. 
Uh, but the Facebook page now is at like 5,500, and some of them are extremely influential people. And I now have, I don't know, 1,100 Facebook friends. It's ridiculous, but I love it. But we're using that, those numbers and that energy to demonstrate something that everybody who gets it needs to understand. We are not closet perverts. We are not idiots. We are, have nothing to be ashamed of. The mainstream media has led us to believe that, and it's our own mistake for allowing them to make us think that we have anything to be ashamed of. There are millions, if not tens of millions, or hundreds of millions of us around the world. We've got 25 countries that have volunteered to beta test our software. Who get that this is the end of industrial civilization. The change of consciousness is happening. I believe, as I said in the movie, we have reached the hundredth, hundredth monkey. And if you want to know my game plan, because I've got a lot more press coming up. With the DVD release, they're going to actually put me on some mainstream shows. And I am tired of apologizing for anything. It's time for us to be aggressive, to be bold, and to say, what do you mean you don't get it? And, and as a result, on, on CollapseNet, we're turning the table around. CollapseNet will be a zombie-free zone. What is a zombie? A zombie is somebody who believes that infinite growth is possible. A zombie is somebody who believes that hydrogen is going to solve all of our problems. A zombie is somebody who believes, okay, we don't want any zombies, no zombies allowed. We're turning the tables because this truly is a matter of survival and we need to find that strength to reinforce ourselves within our own awareness to energize and we need to find out who's doing what around the world. I mean. I was just discussing it today. I was at a place called Yestermorrow, with, with, and great place. And I've been, you know, touring some of these places. And I said, one of the things CollapseNet wants to do is, let's say some guy in Northern California has found a way to make epoxy resins, resins from hemp seed oil, not using petroleum. That's something that should be shared. And CollapseNet wants to gather all that information in one place to find out what solutions have been arrived at where so that as you are looking at your needs where you live, you can come to CollapseNet as we build it. Believe me, we're doing this on a shoestring. We're going to start lean, but we're going to grow. So that you can come and look for the answers or pose the questions that you're looking for that are specific to Burlington or Stowe or Stafford or wh wherever you live in, in, in the state. <clears throat> and say, this is the problem we're having, who's got an answer? And maybe somebody in Romania has already answered it. That's what we need to do, and we need to do it fast. If anybody could find a bottle of water, I'm going to start coughing real quick. I haven't had any water for a while. I could use a glass. But um, So, I'm really glad to be here because being in a room with people like, like, like Dennis and Jerry and Ian and... and, and, and I can feel your attitude here anyway. You know, it, it, it really encourages me. <clears throat> and, and, and it does give me hope. I'm, I am not a pessimist. <clears throat> but I must emphasize that there is no more time. You cannot think about next year. You must think about getting sustainable locally right now. The facts are there. And, and above all else, just remember... Deepwater Horizon, 25,000 to 100,000 barrels of oil per day, unchecked. That is a cataclysmic event. Just take that alone, and it's reason to be worried. But we have all these other things happening. So that's reason to be motivated. Now, while, while somebody's going out to get me some water, I think what I'll do is, I don't know how long I've been talking, but I think what I'd like to do now is maybe stop and ask if you have any questions, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. Yeah. Do you see the, the uh, internet holding up through all this, or what do you, where do you see that going? There is a, there's, a, there, there, there's a thought process that I see running through a lot of people's heads, and, 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 and I'm not picking on you, but you, you just raise an interesting discussion point. People think that we'll either have food or we won't. We'll have the internet or we won't. That's not the way it's going to work. 
you will see sporadic failures. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, my fear level about a massive cyber attack from China is about a 6 or a 7. Uh, how many people are aware that uh, there were massive cyber attacks on Google and Gmail? How many were there at the same time the Chinese, thank you very much, had, had massive cyber attacks on, on Indian computer systems? Okay, so again, if, if, if there is an attack on Iran or when push comes to shove, we can expect a massive cyber attack. You might lose Gmail or Yahoo Mail, whereas if you had mail on separate servers not handled by them, you might stand a better chance of keeping your email for a while. It might not be affected. But you will see also, uh, I've received very detailed intelligence that uh, uh, information from inside Microsoft that they have like 2,000 mobile hub server trucks already dispersed around the country preparing for power blackouts and a cyber attack so that they can plug in. The big powers know this is coming. Excuse me. You have to fill my car with oil. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. All right. They know this is coming. So you will see sporadic losses of the Internet. And one thing that's abundantly clear to me, I'm, I'm 59, you know, and, and, and I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty clear now that anybody who's under 40 is going to be useless without a computer for a while because they don't know how to do anything any other way. You know, I was recently up in Northern California, and it was a 10-year-old girl was out at this, at this ranch, and, and she walks by an, an axe, and she goes, what's that? It's an axe. And, and, and tonight we were talking, who was somebody was talking about uh, in West Virginia that they had a, you know, a the town of, full of super obese kids, and they had a, a whole tray of fresh vegetables on the table, tomatoes, celery, lettuce, cucumber, and not, not a child in the room could identify the vegetables. Okay, so... The Internet will fail sporadically and intermittently. You will see all massive efforts. And, and I read the, the Patriot Act and the Homeland Security Bill cover to cover. I've been studying that. I wrote about it from the wilderness. Everything in, in those measures in U.S. government uh, uh, strategy is intended to protect critical infrastructure. There are not enough troops in this country to impose martial law, so disabuse yourself of that. In, in CONUS, the, the last time I checked, there were only maybe 13 combat brigades. That's not enough to protect the airports, the microwave towers, the banks, the radio stations, the TVs, the hospitals. So you will not see troops on every tree, street. What you will see is anarchy. What you will see is nature at its best or at its worst. And, you know, I am a firearms expert. I was a cop. I've trained with special forces. I know how to shoot. I don't think everybody should own a gun, but I think everybody who does own a gun should be thoroughly trained with it and should find people who are 11 Bravos or have, have infantry combat experience or law enforcement experience to teach them. But that's something you must look at also. So the Internet will be around for a while. I don't know. As, as we're setting up Collapse, that I told our board of directors, we build this company on the assumption that we will have the Internet for no more than two years. And if we do, if we have it longer, great. If not... I've read a lot on this, on this topic. And done a lot Would you please about. use the mic? Um, I've done a lot of reading on this topic and thought a lot about it, and it seems like the uh, solutions that have been presented to us are radically out of proportion with the problem. Um, the by solutions, the government, you mean? No, 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 just by, by anybody who's been thinking and writing about it. Um, my question to you is, what does a lifeboat really look like, and how do we keep other people out of it? I mean, if we're building lifeboats and other people aren't, there are plenty of people with guns, there are plenty of people with, you know, power. How, what really can we do? What does a lifeboat look like? First, let me give you the facetious answer because I need to make a joke because you have to keep making jokes, otherwise you kind of lose it. Uh, if you were a Viking, your lifeboat would look like, you know, have a Viking helmet and, you know, a bare-chested woman, you know, sailing off, and that's the way you would design it. But every lifeboat will look different for every locality because the needs are defined by where you live. 
different climates, different regions, different soil qualities, different access to fresh water, different geography, different topography, different demographics, all of those determine what kind of lifeboat you need to build. There is no one size fits all, period. To, to try and determine what your lifeboat needs, go to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You ever heard of that? What do you need first? You need air. You can only go so long without air. You need water. You can go a little bit longer without water. You need food. You need shelter. You need start your lifeboats on that premise. Take care of the basic needs first and then see what you can do. Now, how do you keep people from taking it? Again, it depends upon where you live. In California, which I predict will split into two or three states, maybe, maybe even four states, inevitably, uh, you got a completely different set of problems. You have uh, many millions of people in the Bay Area who will either go into the San Joaquin Valley looking for food or they'll go to Northern California, which is basically a flat plain, uh, and they'll go on the rampage. Vermont, you're kind of isolated geographically. You've got Lake Sh Champlain for a border, you know, you've got some mountains around you. The Canadians ain't going to come down here and take it. Uh, you know, so you build your lifeboat, you have to make tactical and strategic assessments of where you live. There's no one size fits all. You got to do that work for yourselves. I, I've been asked to consult, and, and that's one of the reasons why. I, I mean, I've been to Martha's Vineyard, I've been to Portland, I've been, to, and these people are flying me in to take a look at their communities, and they got to pay me because I can't afford to do this for free to spend a week of my time to give them precious advice. But people are doing that with me now, and, and, and other people who understand. And I just give the thoughts. You know, I say, okay, like there was one place, I'm not going to mention the place. It's a perfectly secluded valley in, in Northern California that has just about everything. There's only one road in and one road out. After spending two or three days there, I said, what you need is a doctor. You don't have a doctor living here. You need a pharmacy here. And you need satellite uplink for internet access because if there is a cyber attack, it'll take out the fiber opt opt optic cables and the computer servers. That was my recommendation for that place. It, it wouldn't apply to another place. You understand what I'm saying? With that? Well, Ver then Vermont shouldn't advertise that it has food. You know? And a, a lot of them aren't going to be that smart. And, and I tell you, half the New Yorkers will, will kill themselves before they get out of Pennsylvania. They'll, the, the, they'll kill each other, okay? You know, you're, there is no perfect answer in war or combat or survival, and anybody who pretends to give it to you is lying. You do the best you can with what you got, and you take your chances. Who's next? Yeah, go ahead. I, people throw these great names at me, and I've read little bits of it, but I'm not going to pass judgment. I mean, I, I can't read everybody who's at it now, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly familiar with, uh, with Greer's work, and basically it looks like he's okay. He's playing the same sheet music as the rest of us. That's basically all I can tell you, you know? It's a lot of people out there, you know? But, uh, again, the old-timers can't read all the ones who have come along since. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you. I don't think that's on. Check the switch to the mic. Hello. Hi. Well, what would you say to someone who's interested in helping people who are dependent on the medical industrial complex? So people who are sick um, and who need medicine as their, one of their primary problems. I get asked a lot of tough questions, and that's one of them. I mean... Uh, first of all, I'm of the absolute belief that a great deal of the prescription medicines, medicines out there that people are convinced they need today aren't necessary. You know. Uh, and secondly, as one who was buried, I'm an only child, I buried both of my parents, and I watched them keep my mother alive seven years longer in abject misery just so they could churn bills for goddamn Medicare and the pharmaceutical companies. However, you get to other situations. You get to a diabetic who needs insulin. You get to, uh, you know, people who absolutely need medication. 
there again, these are tough problems and they are not all soluble. You can't stop stockpile enough of everything. Uh, although I have several friends in LA who are, who, are, who are diabetic and they asked me and I said, look, you're going to die of something else a long time before you die for a lack of, lack of insulin. Uh, and again, there are a lot of homeopathic remedies that have been suppressed. There are a lot of great uh, uh, organic and herbal treatments that really work. I am, I, I am on no prescription medication of any kind, and I don't need it. Um, but again, that is a fact of nature that under ordinary circumstances, these are people who wouldn't be alive anyway. And I am not being at all cynical about that or calloused about that. It's just a fact. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen combat. I've been shot. I've been in shootings. I've talked to a great many soldiers. And the fact is that what happens is people do, go, do die. Um, and again, it's about people's willingness also to let go and look for new solutions. I don't have all the answers for that. And again, on a case-by-case -case basis, you would have to take it illness by illness and medicine by medicine. And I'm not God. I really don't want to touch that one. That's, that's tough. There are going to be a lot of tough questions and a lot of tough answers. Somebody had a question over here. <laughs> you need to say that in the mic. They're, they're recording this, which is, which is good. And it, it, the, the question was... Yeah, the, the, the question was, is Richard Branson going to sell his airline? I don't know. He's, he's not sharing that with me. Uh, 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 you see a lot of smart people getting out of the business. Now, what's happening historically as collapse proceeds is the clock is rolling backwards. We are reverting to a feudal society. Martha's Vineyard flew me in uh, for about five days, and Martha's Vineyard's a great place. Anybody been there? It's a wonderful place. Uh, great weed. And uh, uh, what's happening is over the course of the last few years, there's an influx of billionaires from major Wall Street corporations, Goldman Sachs, Monsanto, I mean all the corporations we love to hate, and they're buying 50 to 150, 200 acre estates and they're walling them in with stone walls. And the locals who live there year round are working for below normal wages and they're living like serfs, servicing the castle. I thought that was a very eloquent model. But you see, as the clock rolls backward, we're seeing robber barons emerge. Warren Buffett's now owning utilities and railroads. So we're going back now through the 1890s. I clipped a story from Britain, which is much worse off than we are right now, that said that uh, in a short period of time, living conditions would be as bad as they were in Victorian England in the 1890s. The clock is rolling backwards. I don't know if Branson's going to sell or not, but he's a very sharp guy. He's not going to get off the planet. Nobody's getting off the planet, but he knows what's going on. And, uh, geez, if he told me, it wouldn't make any difference to my life anyway. Yes, ma'am. Nuclear power is, is something that's very much on the minds of Vermonters as we have an aging nuclear power plant um, and that it's possible that it won't function anymore. But in your book, you say that it may be necessary to build nuclear power plants. Oh, I said it, yeah. Oh, you said it. And I wrote that two years ago. It's no longer possible, <laughs> but go ahead. Okay, well, that, that's my question. I mean, with the uh, embedded energy in building the plant, the number of years it takes, okay. Too late. You want to talk about it? Too late. The, 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 the simple answer is, is that the capital investment cost for, for a nuclear plant is, you know, $20, $30 billion, and you've got a 13-year incubation period. And I'm sorry, but, you know, the world's long past, since past peak uranium. Richard Heinberg d documented that very clearly. Th there's not, none of that stuff's going to get built. We're in the collapse phase now. The grid is failing. Okay, so no more nuclear, no. Well, there will be a problem about what, what to do with the U-238 that's left lying around in the plant, but, you know, or U-238 or 35, one of the two, but, you know, the most poisonous stuff on the planet. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, my wife and I live in Burlington and rent a small uh, house here. Um, and Burlington, I think you know a little bit about Burlington. It's a very interesting community. There's a lot of farming that goes on in the Intervale, um, very close to the downtown center of Burlington. It's a great community. Um, I own some land 
out in a very rural area um, in Topsom, Vermont. Um, would you suggest that my wife and I head to the woods <laughs> where, and I can shoot and we can both garden, um, and I have good neighbors in the woods, but what would your recommendation be to our near future plans? Well, top of your head, where do you feel most comfortable? Don't think about it, just answer. Next question. <laughs> what I have learned is this, uh, and, and having spent a lot of time with uh, with Army Special Forces guys, what what Army Special Forces teaches is you are never ever stronger and more effective than you are where you are indigenous. Running at this juncture to any new place with which you're not familiar is an almost tantamount to an act of suicide. Okay, uh, I went to, I, I, I moved 14 times through seven states before we landed in Venice, California, Marina del Rey in 1968. Now, I've lived a lot of places since, but that's my home. I went to Venice High and UCLA. I was a cop there. I know every street. I know every alley. I know the culture. I look like the locals. I know where the stores are. I know where the resources are. I don't have to think about it. You go someplace new where you're unfamiliar, you get into a crunch situation, and all of a sudden you go, now, what was that street? Now, what street do I go down to? And also, if you look different than the people who are there and act different, you don't think ethnocentrism is coming to the, What do you think the Arizona immigration bill is about? There's nine more being introduced right now. You don't think there's going to be a surge of racism in this country and xenophobia like you cannot believe as things get worse? It's as old as mankind. People respond. They, they stick with the people they know and feel comfortable with, and anything that looks different is... It's probably programmed because all species react the same way. So stay where you're indigenous and wherever you feel most comfortable. And I'm not going to go through all that thing again. Stay there. Did you have a question, ma'am? Can you give uh, examples of failed um, cultures or societies where gold has been used as a currency? And how do you see gold? You know, if I turn my 401k into gold, how do you see that working in, in, a, in a collapse situation? Okay. Well, gold for the 6,000 years of man's recorded history has been the one value that, let's say, when the Hittite civilization in, interacted with the Assyrian civilization, interacted with the Egyptian civilization, all of them understood gold. 6,000 years of recorded history. That's in the genes. When the poop hits the fan, Mankind has always returned to gold as a trustworthy standard when currencies have failed, period. I'm not advocating gold, but I'm saying one thing else is that gold is finite. You cannot print gold. That's another great safety valve. But gold is the classic standard hedge against inflation. Our dollars are losing purchasing power rapidly. When hyperinflation hits, Let's say you were fortunate enough to have $100,000 today. In real money value, when hyperinflation hits, that $100,000 in cash might be worth $5,000. Had you bought $100,000 in gold, that $100,000 in gold would now be, would have offset the inflation. I advocate gold, and I have and I always will, until the point in time when mankind achieves a sustainable, steady-state economy. Marion King Hubbard proposed a money based on energy, energy credits. That's probably the, well, that's hypothetical. I am not a progressive who likes to say, well, we could, we might, we should, it's possible. I'm going to let those people die with their coulds, mights, shoulds, and possible. All I'm concerned about for anybody who's aware is preserving your wealth so that you can survive. So that if two years from now you find you suddenly need to buy a generator or some other piece of equipment that costs you know, $20,000 or whatever, your gold will enable you to do that, but your dollars will not. 
So that's all I'm saying about gold, and it's very simple, and I've been right on gold for more than a decade. You see gold now. As everything's falling apart, gold's just passed through 1,200. You'll see 2,000 gold before the end of the year. That's a way to preserve your wealth because as gold goes up, you know your dollars are worth less. I hope that answered your question. Anybody else? I'll take one more, and then I guess that's about to, Okay, now I see two hands. We'll go here, and then young lady here. What do you have to say about uh, large-scale diaspora, people leaving the cities for rural areas as the brownouts began and supplies dwindle? Well, again, people leaving cities uh, is, is, is going to happen certainly faster in Las Vegas and Phoenix <laughs> than it's going to happen in Burlington. Okay, so again, it's, it's, it's situationally specific. So you must look at, but that's obviously going to happen. New York City has, uh, what, 11 million people in New York City. That's obviously not sustainable because they don't grow enough food on Manhattan to feed those people. But, yes, but New York City will be kept alive longer. Why? Because it's the financial center of the country. And I live in Los Angeles, which has the largest port that brings in one fourth, I think, of all the goods brought in from the Pacific come in through the port of San Pedro. So, green zones. Some cities will be protected. The west side of Los Angeles will be protective. San Bernardino and the eastern areas of Los Angeles County are going to become wastelands ruled by gangs. I don't know where they're going to go. But you will see military used to protect critical areas like the ports in Los Angeles, Seattle, San Francisco, because that's needed to keep some kind of semblance in order. But obviously, people are going to go looking for food. That's inevitable. That's going to happen. You had a question. Hi. What would your recommendation for our government be? <laughs> Get out of the way. Get out of the way and let us save ourselves. Um, does he, I mean, is there anybody who believes that the U.S. government is helping things anywhere now anymore? I mean, do, do you honestly think that, that if uh, the Republicans take back, and I'm not even Catholic, take back the Congress in the elections this year, there's going to be any change? No. Uh, the, the book that I wrote, Confronting Collapse, which I'm going to go out and autograph now, if, if, if you come out and buy it, is, uh, was originally called a presidential energy policy. It was written two years ago, almost two years ago. And had it been enacted then, there might have been time for the federal government to do something. The only governments that have any, any relevance to your life, your lives here now, are local governments. That's the place where the rubber meets the road. And here in Vermont, you, you, have, you need to take your state senate. You need to you know, take the state government back and disengage it from the federal government. But I'm seeing this, and I've been contacted. I, I've been to, again, I've been doing this all over the country. But in, in San Francisco, in Portland, in, uh, in Minneapolis, city government officials came to my lectures to ask my advice. Because city governments are where everything is coming, the pressure is coming from both ends. The city governments is where the rubber meets the road. Now, Vermont's a small state. You've got a state government that actually could take action to protect you much more effectively than, let's say, the Los Angeles City Council could where I live. But forget the federal government. And, and I'm sorry, but I think it's useless. Okay, well, well I, now I see more hands. Now I see, all right, first of all, whoever's hosting this, do I have time to take two more questions? Yes. Okay, please, sir. You, 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 the handsome gentleman in the tie. Yes. Once I get home tonight, I'm going to be covered in mud, covering up the beehives and battening them down and just enjoying a moment being clean. <clears throat> When should I make my last mortgage payment, assuming that... <laughs> <laughs> uh, excuse my French, but assuming that the bloody corporate job doesn't go away first, there's a certain sequence of events, and even with an economics degree, it's all BS. Uh, it 
teaches me nothing. There, there, there is a great question, Robert. Thank you. There is, a, you know, there is a huge trend around the country, and 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 we've mentioned, I've commented on this on, on my blog and on Facebook, and all of, all of the blog stuff will roll into CollapseNet as soon as we launch, which might be as early as next week. CollapseNet.com, CollapseNetwork.com. Keep looking for it; it'll be there. There's this huge trend going on now. You, you know, we had the subprime defaults, but now what's happening is this huge wave of prime mortgage foreclosures, and it's become a fad in the country now for middle and upper middle class people to stop paying their mortgages. To stop paying their mortgages. And what are they doing? We, they, they've talked about the recent rise in consumer spending. They're taking their mortgage payments and going to tanning salons, buying cars, and buying new clothes. <laughs> Not very bright. But it is such a fad that now what we have turned these people into is a bunch of scoff laws against the banks. It is? Okay. So now everybody scoffs the banks and things still get worse. Who's left to scoff at? The government. There's no place else to flip off. Civil unrest, revolution, political collapse. Not revolution because it really won't be one side against the government. It'll be like a barroom brawl. When's a good time to stop paying your mortgage? I don't want to be on tape for answering that question. <laughs> Uh, you know, I have never owned a house in my life, so, uh, but uh, at, at, at some point, prudent people are going to realize that that's, but then you've got to figure what's going to happen with a the foreclosure. There's a lot of squatting going on now, people staying in their houses, whatever, and again, everybody has to look at their own situation. There are some people I wouldn't say, don't stop paying your mortgage if you're going to be on the street and you can't afford to rent an apartment, you know, or whatever. That's something you have to look at. If you've got someplace else to go, I mean, you know, if I had a safe place to go where I didn't have to pay a mortgage, I would stop paying the mortgage yesterday. Uh, because I think that the faster this, 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 this comes down, the better. But don't hurt yourself in the process. Don't put yourself in debtor's prison. There was one more, one, one more hand. Then I'll take that and go out and sign some autographs. Yes, sir. First off, thanks for coming to Burlington. Uh, you mentioned a few moments ago about the cliff this summer. I was wondering if you could define that a little bit? Um, throughout peak oil literature, there is what's referred to as, I think Richard Duncan is one of the best guys, he's, he's one of the longest activists on peak oil, Professor Richard Duncan, University of Oregon, also a dear friend of mine. He talks about human industrial civiliz civilization coming up as in, in, in correlation with, with uh, the oil supply and so on and so forth. And then they talk about the bumpy plateau, which is what we're on now. I talk about it in the movie Collapse, which is where uh, roughly 2005, 2006, you would see a, an oil price spike. The economy shuts down, the oil price drops. Then the economy starts to come back, the oil price spikes, and then et cetera. And then th there comes a point where you go off the plateau in the downslope back to the Stone Age. That's the cliff. That's the cliff that we're at now. That's, that's it. Burlington, Vermont, man. I, I just feel good being here. Thank you for, to my heroes and friends for turning out. I'd like to see you again.